It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turning your Bibles to Galatians 2.16. Galatians 2.16. As part of our introduction to Galatians 2.16, we need to get five points on the Mosaic Law. Because here we're going to deal with grace versus the Mosaic Law. So introduction to Galatians 2.16. Five points on the Mosaic Law. Point number one. The content of the Mosaic Law is given in the Pentateuch. Pentateuch is spelled P-E-N-T-A-T-E-U-C-H. P-E-N-T-A-T-E-U-C-H. The Pentateuch content of the Mosaic Law is given in the Pentateuch. That's where we get Pentagon. Five edges. Well, there are five books in the Bible known as the Pentateuch and they are broken into three different parts. Actually, three different codes. The Mosaic Law has three different codes. This is still part of point one. There's Codex number one. Codex number one of the Mosaic Law. Codex number one of the Mosaic Law is the Moral Law. And what does the Moral Law do? It proves to us that every man is a sinner and needs a Savior. The Moral Law, Codex number one, proves that every man is a sinner and needs a Savior. Then we have Codex number two. Codex number two is related to Shadow Christology. Shadow Christology. And shadow Christology anticipates the coming of Jesus Christ. That's where we have the Le Levitical offerings, etc., in which uh, they would uh, go through some, uh, they would go through certain rituals in order to communicate our Lord Jesus Christ coming in the future. So Codex number two, shadow Christology, anticipates the coming of Christ. Then we have Codex number three. Codex number three is the social law. Part of the social law in the Mosaic law was do not hang around with Gentiles. If you're a Jew, separate yourself from Gentiles. If you're a Jew, you can do business with Gentiles, you can take their money, but you cannot hang around them. And that was part of Codex number three, the social law. And do not eat pork, and they had all sorts of sanitary laws, etc. Codex number one, the moral law. Codex number two, shadow Christology. And codex number three, the social law. So the second principle as an introduction to Galatians 2.16. The law was given to Israel only. The law is not given to us as church age believers. The law was given to Israel only. This is something very few understand today in Christianity. Most churches follow still the Mosaic law. And they think that on Sunday they can't do anything. That's ridiculous. That's insane. They're trying to follow a law that was given to Israel only. And besides, the Sabbath is Saturday. If you really wanted to go into covenant theology, join a Seventh-day Adventist church. They follow it more closely than others. But it's not about the Mosaic Law. The law was given to Israel only. The law was never, ever given to the Gentiles. You want scriptural reference? Exodus 19.3, given to Israel. Romans 3.19, given to Israel. That is the Mosaic Law, given to Israel. Romans 9.4. And the negative side of it is the law is specifically not given to Gentiles. Deuteronomy 4.8. Deuteronomy 4.8. You can write it down, look it up later. It's there. The law is specifically not given to us, only given to Israel. And we are not Israel. We're not the United States of Israel. We're nowhere close to Israel. We're across the whole ocean. Actually, two. 
go across the Mediterranean, then go across the Atlantic, and we are the United States of America. We are not Israel. We do not, we do not have to follow the Mosaic Law. Point three. Christians are specifically not under the law. Christians, that means you and me, those of us who believed in Christ, all of us, I'm pretty sure. Christians are specifically not under the law. Acts 15.5 Acts 15.24 Romans 6.14 Galatians 2.19 We'll get there in a minute. So Christians are out from under the law. And why are we out from under the law? Matthew 5.17 Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. And in Matthew 5.17 it says Jesus Christ did not come to destroy the law but to fulfill it. So he fulfilled the law. Since he fulfilled it, we're not under it. So now point number four. What is the present purpose of the Mosaic Law? What's the present purpose of the Mosaic Law? There is a purpose for it, and there's a purpose for it even presently, even today in the church age. The present purpose for the Mosaic Law is to prove to sinners that they are sinners. It's to prove to sinners that they are sinners. How does it do that? Because nobody can fulfill the Mosaic Law except Christ. All of us come short of the Mosaic Law in every way. Every man ever alive except for Jesus Christ came short of the Law. So the present, present purpose of the Mosaic Law is to show that uh, you are a sinner. We're under a different law now. We are not lawless. We're under a different law. We're under the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And we'll note the passage of that after a little while. We're under the unique spiritual life. And under the unique spiritual life, we're under a higher law. Much higher than the Mosaic law. Let's flip over to Romans 3.20 to expound on this a bit more. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3 verse 20. Hold your place where you are because we'll be getting back to Galatians 2.16. But Romans 3.20... The funny thing about covenant theology, it, it just seems that they've never read any of the epistles of Paul. They, they definitely read James. When it comes to the epistles of Paul, they just don't even, they don't even understand what it's saying, obviously. They gloss over it because it's right there. Everything that I teach to you, it's right there in the Bible. I'm not making anything up. Romans 3.20. We'll start with the phrase, therefore. Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. I believe I just read King James Version too. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. What's the purpose of the law? So that you can know you're a sinner. And that's it for us. Now let's look at Romans 3.28. Romans 3.28 says, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Faith plus nothing. Faith plus no deeds of the law. It's right there in Scripture for all of us to chew on. So that's point four. The present purpose of the Mosaic Law is to prove that we're sinners. Romans 3.20 Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in, in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And this is important to note right now because we're going to get to a, a, a point in a moment in which the Apostle Paul is going to use another mouse trap technique. And he's going to trap the people and actually he's going to trap Peter once again. And this is what's going to happen in Galatians 2.16 so back to Galatians 2.16 and as you turn there there's point number 5 of course that I need to get to point number 5 the limitation of the law 
The Mosaic law cannot justify. That's the first limitation. You can't be saved by the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law cannot justify. The Mosaic law cannot give life. The Mosaic law cannot provide the Holy Spirit. The Mosaic law cannot produce miracles. And that was important at that time, pre-canon era. So again, the Mosaic law cannot justify. The Mosaic law cannot give life. The Mosaic law cannot provide the Holy Spirit. The Mosaic law cannot produce miracles. Yet in covenant theology, most believers today think they need to live under the law. And part of them living under the law, well, they only live under part of it. Notice most Christians still eat pork. They still eat shrimp. But under the Mosaic law, that is prohibited. Under the social law, you can't eat pork. You can't eat shrimp. You can't eat bacon. And if you're going to follow the Sabbath, you better make all of your food. And if you're going to follow it on Sunday, you better make all of your food on Saturday. And then on Sunday, not eat at all. But actually, if you're going to follow it exactly, you better make all your food on Friday and not have the little lady cooking breakfast Saturday morning. And all day, you better eat on the food that was produced on Friday. That's the law. And if you want to follow the law, follow it. It's re you can't just follow parts of it and then uh, mix it around and say, well, I'll do this and that as part of tradition. So the Mosaic Law has its limitations. Now let's look at Galatians 2.16. Galatians 2.16. Yet we... Who's we? Well, remember, Paul is still chewing out Peter and he's saying, me, Paul, and Peter. You know, he's looking at Peter right now, chewing him out. And he, he probably hasn't uh, stopped having eye contact with Peter just yet, although Peter's probably about to crawl under the pew or wherever they were. Now, Peter probably wasn't looking at Paul, but Paul was staring down Peter. I know, because it happened to me when I would get chewed out. I, I would not look at my pastor chewing me out. had to look down. No, I'm not looking at you, man. You can look at me all you want. I'm not looking at you. And that's probably what Peter was doing, hanging his head. And he should have been hanging his head. So yet we, and he's referring to Peter and Paul, also Barnabas, yet we know that no one is vindicated by the works of the law, but by faith. Faith is the instrument of justification, of course, not the law. Believe in Christ and you'll be saved. We should all know that. And the Galatians should have known it. Yet we, Peter and Paul, know that no one is vindicated by the works of the law but by faith. This was something Peter knew. This was something Barnabas knew. And even though Peter knew it, he's still going for legalism. And why is he going for legalism? He's following the crowd. That's why he wants to be looked at as favorable. He has approbation lust among people. He doesn't like to be talked about. He doesn't like to be run into the ground. Well, who does? But when it comes to this gospel of Christ, if we're going to stand for anything, we better stand for that. Now, all the other things in life, you can back down on those, but when it comes to standing for the gospel, you better stand for that. If you're not going to stand for anything else, stand for the gospel. And don't go along with all the legalists just because you want friends. It's an, and that's exactly what Peter was doing. But he knew it. He knew he was justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Then continuing, even we, Peter and Paul, have believed in Jesus Christ so that we may be justified. Now this uh, in the Greek is an aorist tense. Aorist tense. Aorist is A-O-R-I-S-T. It's aorist tense. And aorist tense means once and for all. It means they've been justified once and for all. They can't lose their salvation. Aorist tense in the Greek. They've been justified once and for all by what? By faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because the works of the law will not vindicate anyone. So faith is a bona fide system of perception. And faith implies the absence of human merit. And it keeps in concert with the concept of grace. When you go to school, you may have never been to Europe, but you learn about Europe. You go to history class and they'll tell you about the history of Europe. You've never been there. You've never seen it. You're not able to rationally say, yes, Europe exists. 
You accept it by faith. And when the history teacher gets up and shows you a map of Europe, you accept that map. Well, and it's all faith. You've never seen it. You've never detailed it for yourself. Or the history teacher talks about the history of Russia. You've never been to Russia. I've never been to Russia. You may have. I know I haven't. I wouldn't want to go there. But uh, you accept it by faith that it exists. And you accept Jesus Christ exists by faith. And you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior by faith. And it's non-meritorious. No merit attached to it. And that is exactly how faith operates. Now we have a subject in salvation, and the subject is you, whosoever. Whosoever is the subject. Whosoever believes in Christ, that's the subject. The object in salvation is always Jesus Christ. Always. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which man can be saved except Jesus Christ. So he's the object of our faith. We're the subject, whosoever. Now Peter here is guilty of using the works of the law. He's guilty of going into legalism and the energy of the flesh. But we note that by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The law will never provide justification for any person. It never has and it never will. As long as the world exists, the law has never provided ever salvation. The law did not provide salvation to Abraham, and why not? There was no law when Abraham was born. Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was credited to his account for righteousness. And guess what? No Mosaic law existed when Abraham was born. Imagine that for a second, you covenant theologists. Not you, I'm talking in general about the way most people are today. And they say you must follow the law. You must do this and that and the other. And they even get the Mosaic law wrong. They don't know anything about that either. Now, one lady was all up on the Mosaic law. Well, I wouldn't marry a divorced man. So I said, Moses, the author of the Mosaic law, got divorced and remarried. Well, she didn't know what to say. What could she say? Now, of course, Jesus Christ is the author. It was revealed to Moses. But it's always attached to Moses, Mosaic law. And Moses himself was divorced and remarried. So they don't even know what the Mosaic Law is all about to start with. But in every denomination today, what do they teach? And I mean denomination. There are some independent churches that do not teach this. But in most denominations, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic, pick them. doesn't matter where you go. They want to go back to the law for justification. And they want to go back to the law for justification, for salvation. And if they don't do that, they go back to the law for justification by spirituality. Or they think the law is spiritual. Nothing spiritual about the law. So you cannot serve principle. You cannot serve the Lord by having one foot in the law and one foot in grace. And that's what most believers do today. You cannot serve the Lord by having one foot in the law and one foot in grace. It's like you're wearing a boot, a boot on one foot and an ice skate on the other. It's not going to work. You can't serve the Lord that way. Uh, see, the ice skate's for grace. You're just going to slide along. But the boot gets stuck in the mud, so you have a big split and it hurts. You cannot serve the Lord by having one foot in the law and one foot in grace, and that's what most churches do today. And it's sad, very sad, because they're nowhere near the spiritual life, and if they are saved, they're confusing others as to the way of salvation. And that's our country today, the state of our country. And we're not falling apart because of all the politics. We're falling apart because Christians don't know I was going to say something bad, but Christians don't know anything about Scripture. They don't know anything. Uh, they, they try to follow the law, but they don't follow it exactly. If you're going to follow the law, follow it, and follow it exactly. If I were to stand up here today and I thought, I need to follow the law to be saved, I would follow it to a T, or try to. Of course, none of us would be able to, but I would be trying just as hard, probably harder than any of you, if I thought that the way to be saved was by the law, I would be trying very hard to follow the law. And on Sunday, my grass would grow, and I wouldn't do a thing. I would sit down, and I would dedicate, and I would pray in a closet, and I would do all sorts of things that would be energy of the flesh. 
but it has no meaning. And yet, today it's all covenant theology. So now let's get an introduction to verse 17. Now in Galatians 2.17, there's another logical mousetrap. Another logical mousetrap actually given to Peter. Now we don't have Peter mentioned anymore. He pointed out Peter in the beginning and he started chewing out Peter. Now he stopped mentioning Peter, but he's still chewing out Peter. In a moment, he'll shift from Peter to the whole churches of Galatia. And that will be in chapter 3. But right now, Peter's still getting a shellacking. And Paul has not let up in any way. And he's going to set another logical mousetrap for Peter. So let's get an introduction to this. First of all, the legalists have come in and they have said, do not trust Paul. The legalists have come into the Galatian churches there's more than one church. There's many churches in Galatia. And they've said to the Galatian church, Don't trust Paul. He's trying to get you to abandon the law. He's trying to take you away from salvation. And that's what they've said. And Peter, although he doesn't believe that, follows them because he's scared. He follows them because he has approbation, lust. He wants the approval of people. He wants to be popular so he follows the popular trend. And the popular trend at this time is to follow the law. And so he's going to go along with the trend. Secondly, Paul's bracing of Peter proves Paul knows the purpose of the law. And he's already mentioned the purpose of the law. And it's important you know the purpose of the law for this mousetrap technique that's coming up. Again, think about it. What is the purpose of the law for us? to let us know we're sinners. That's it. The law lets us know that we're sinners. Why? Well, the law tells us not to steal. Have we ever stolen anything? I have when I was little. You may have too when you were younger and you say, I didn't know any better. It doesn't matter. You still broke the law. And uh, there are many laws that we have broken, knowingly or unknowingly. Have you fornicated? Have you committed adultery? Have you done this, that, and the other? None of my business, but we've all broken the law. Have you lied? All of us have lied, definitely. Even though the law is referring to perjury, we've all lied anyway. So that's breaking of the law. And so guess what? All of us know we've sinned. All of us. Therefore, the law is an educator. And the law educates us and says to you, you're a sinner and you're in need of a Savior. And that's what the law does for us. And Paul knows this. Paul knows the purpose of the law. And the genius that he is, he's going to take this knowledge and use it as a mousetrap against Peter. So what Paul is saying is this. If Peter was right by keeping the law at this point, at this point, Peter's keeping the law. And in the mousetrap, he's saying, Peter, if you're right by keeping the law, then you were wrong when you didn't keep the law. And if you were wrong when you, and if you were right when you didn't keep the law, then you're wrong now that you're under the law. What he's saying is, in other words, Peter, you're wrong every time. No matter how you slice it, you're wrong. Only a genius would come up with a mousetrap like this. And for us to understand it, well, let's bring it down into English so we can understand something about this mouse trap. Let's put it this way. Here's Peter. Here's Peter, and um, first of all, he's dating this woman over here. You'll see her as a woman in a minute. He's dating this woman over here called the law. That's the law. He's dating this woman, the law. And notice she has a bun. That's why I made her the law. So first of all, Peter's dating this woman. And then he believes in Christ, so he breaks away from her and says, I don't want to date you anymore. I want to date Grace Woman. So he comes down here. And he dates Grace Woman. They're both ugly, but 
This one's got long, pretty hair. This one's all up in a bun. Both ugly, of course. So now he's dating Grace. And so what has Peter done? Well, he started out with the law. I'll be saved by the law. And then he found out, nope, all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ. So now he's dating Grace. And as he is dating Grace, you know what he does? He goes up to the Gentiles and say, you know what? You need to go over here and date the law. You need to over, go over here and date this woman. You need to go over here and date this woman that I have gotten rid of. Now, does that make any sense? No. So he's telling all the Gentiles, leave Grace and go to the ugly woman that I was dating in legalism. And so Paul has put him in a mousetrap and he said, all right, you dated this woman. Then you left her. Then you went back to her. Now you were wrong at some point. Were you wrong to leave her? Or were you wrong to go back? Either way, he was wrong. He could have, If uh, he was right to stay with the law, Paul would have said, well, you were right to stay with the law, but you left the law, so when you left the law, you were wrong. When you left this ugly woman, you were wrong. You should have stayed with her. But now you've gone to grace, and you went back to the law. Now, if you were right with going to grace, and now you're going back to the law, are you right or are you wrong? Either way, he's wrong at some point. And that is the mousetrap. So I hope that brings it down to a level. I am not an artist. If I could play a song about it, I might be better. Definitely not an artist. Maybe I get my mom up here to draw a legalist woman with a bun. And then a pretty girl with long hair. That's Grace. So now let's look at Galatians 2.17. And this is the mousetrap, another mousetrap. Part of that was referring back to the first mousetrap. Now in Galatians 2.17, another mousetrap. But if... Now this is first class condition. First class condition of if in the Greek means but if and it's true. But if and it's true, while seeking to be justified in Christ, that is what they did. We, Peter, Paul, Barnabas, we ourselves have been found sinners. Now again, how have they been found sinners? According to the Mosaic Law. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners, is Christ the one who encourages sin? Let it not become so. Now, you, in the English, you don't have a clue what this is saying. It's a debater's technique. And I'm going to have to explain it to you slowly. So when you go back to the law for justification after living under grace, what you're saying is Christ did not do enough, first of all, what we need to note about this. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners, is Christ the one who encourages sin? Now this is a slap in Peter's face. And what Peter is saying is what Christ did on the cross was not enough. Now what did the law do for Peter? The law for Peter let it be known to Peter that he was under sin. And so what Peter is saying now, basically, is that Christ is the minister of sin. And why is he saying that? Because he's went back to the Mosaic law that teaches him he's a sinner. He's gone back to the Mosaic law that teaches him that he's a sinner yet he's believed in Christ, so what he's saying is Christ didn't do enough. I have to go back to the law that teaches me I'm a sinner. Therefore, as a result, Christ is the minister of sin. It might be hard to understand right off, but this is what Paul is telling him. So Paul is demonstrating to Peter in one phrase, and in it's Greek, that by going back to the law, which is what Peter has done, he has in effect said that Christ is not the minister of salvation, but the minister of sin. He's saying Christ could not save. The law is going to save. Therefore, that makes Christ the minister of sin. Why? Christ fulfilled the law. I hope you can start to see this by now. So again, the purpose of the law is to prove that sinners are sinners. And if Christ needs outside help from the law, which proves that sinners is sinners, 
That makes Christ a sinner. So there you see the blasphemy. And Paul has just trapped Peter in a great blasphemy. And anyone in legalism is blasphemous. They are living a lifestyle of blasphemy. And you should avoid them. You wouldn't walk around, you wouldn't hang around an atheist, would you, who constantly says there is no God? You wouldn't constantly hang around an atheist who constantly mocks your God. Well, legalists mock him every day. And they're in blasphemy. And they, by the works of the law, are saying Christ didn't do enough and Christ, in effect, is a minister of sin. And that is the trap Paul has put Peter in. And Peter has to be, by now, crawling under the table. Or wherever he was, he has to be feeling pretty bad. And he should. Now let's look at Galatians 2.18. He continues to build this trap. He's already got Peter trapped in that way, but he's going to continue to build on it. But if I build up again those things I once destroyed, I keep on making myself a transgressor. But if I build up again those things I have once destroyed, I keep on making myself a transgressor. What is Peter doing? Peter is building upon something that's already been destroyed. When Peter accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, he in effect destroyed the law. But now he's picked up the law again and he's trying to build upon the law once again. He's trying to build upon something he's already destroyed. You see the uh, fallacy in that. Then it goes on to say, I keep on, I, uh, linear action, sorry, I keep on making myself a transgressor. So Peter has made himself a transgressor because he's made Christ out to be a minister of sin and he's wrong. And I tell you, no one's ever been chewed out, chewed out like this before. Now we note Jesus Christ said, Get behind me, Satan. He was talking to Peter. That's a pretty good chew out from Jesus Christ himself. But this ranks right up there. And that's because Paul keeps going and going, keeps hammering this guy. And he deserves it. He deserves every bit of it. Peter actually got shredded. There's one thing I like about Peter, though, and that's the twelfth part of... Well, we've noted the, all the bad things about his personality traits, but one thing that's wonderful about Peter is his humility. And this is what uh, caused Peter to go into recovery, and this is what caused Peter to be a great believer. He was flexible enough to recognize his sins. And actually, what he's doing now is more than sin, it's wrongdoing. Peter has gotten into the wrongdoing of legalism. And uh, sin is one thing, and it's bad, and you need to rebound and keep moving. But when you go into legalism, you've gone into a system of evil. You've gone into wrongdoing. And Peter is in a system of evil, and he's going to have to rebound. And that's part of God's grace, that when you rebound, you actually remove the system of evil as well if you follow up with the filling of the Spirit. So you rebound and keep moving, and this is what set Peter apart from everyone else. This is what sets Peter apart from everyone else in Christendom today. If I were to get up and uh, chew somebody out like Paul chewed out Peter, more than likely they would be so upset they would never come back. But if they had the humility of Peter, they would say, you know what, Paul was right. I got chewed out and it wasn't fun. I guarantee you it wasn't fun. But he would say to himself, Paul's right and i got to take it as from God himself. And it was from God himself. Uh, remember, Paul had the gift of knowledge and also knew all about these things. Paul was so far ahead of Peter by now, it is abs abs almost laughable. So legalism is always characterized by hypocrisy and contradiction. Legalism is always characterized by hypocrisy and contradiction. Again, if you're going to follow the Mosaic Law, follow it. If you're not going to work on Sunday, well, follow it to a T and don't work on Saturday and don't eat pork and don't eat bacon and don't eat shrimp and follow the law. And by the way, why don't you just go ahead and start building altars in your backyard and start sacrificing some sheep? And they did that in Israel. It's in the Bible. 
And that's what they'll say. Oh, you have to follow the Sabbath. It's in the Bible. Well, also in the Bible, they slaughtered animals. Are you going to do that? You would be crazy to do that. And why aren't you going to do that? You're not an Israelite. You're an American. You're in the church age. You're a Christian. You have a new law to follow, a greater law. It's so weird. People want to go back to the law of Israel when it is inferior to what we have. I'm, let me come up with a way to explain it to you. I, I think that, let me give you this story. I think this is how it goes. There was a man in California and he bought this uh, property and it had a, a barn on it, etc. And he was going to turn it into a great uh, farming land. And so he started farming on this thing. And then a great flood came and just washed his farm away. And when it washed it away, he found out that under his farm was a ton of gold. Now what did he do? Did he go and rebuild the farm? Did he say, oh, it's so terrible that the farm is gone. Oh, look, there's gold, so what? I'm going to rebuild the farm just the way it was. No. What'd he do? He went and dug for the gold. Well, that's how it is with you. You don't, have, you don't have the farm anymore. It's been washed away by Christ. The law's been washed away. The law would be the farm. The Levitical offerings. All those things, they've been washed away. And you're sitting on a pile of gold, and that's the grace. And we're in the dispensation of grace, and that's what you should dig for. Yet what most believers do, sitting on a pile of gold, is create a farm. A rickety farm with a rickety barn. They're missing out on all that gold. And that is exactly what you do if you go back to the Mosaic Law. And it's worse than that, really. That's just a way to put it, but it's worse than that. You've gone straight in for evil. So then in 2.19, Galatians 2.19, For through the law I died to the law. For through the law I died to the law, so that I may live to God. For through the law, remember Christ fulfilled the law, I died to the law. How did he die to the law? Through identification with Christ through his death. Jesus Christ died on the cross. So he's identified with Christ in his burial and resurrection and through his death. Therefore he's died to the law too so that I may live to God. So again, by means of the law, I'm dead to the law, is what Paul is saying. And as soon as you put yourself under the law, you're dead. As soon as you put yourself under the law, you're dead. And we're all under the law uh, as unbelievers, and we recognize at some point we're sinners, and we should recognize we're spiritually dead. Yet most people still by the law try to work their way into heaven. But we're dead. And the best thing the law can do for you is to kill you. The best thing the law can do for us is kill us. That is in our thinking. Because once we recognize, once we get to God consciousness and once we recognize that we're all under a system of law, you recognize you've sinned. Once you get to God consciousness, you've recognized that and you know everyone else has as well, and therefore you should recognize you're dead. So the best thing that the knowledge of the law can do for you is for you to recognize you're in spiritual death. So what we have here is retroactive positional truth. And that's why, that's why Paul said, I died to the law. Retroactive positional truth. We're in position with Christ. Remember, when you believe in Christ, you're put in position with Christ. And Christ went to the cross and died as a substitute for us. Since we're in position with Christ, we too have died as it were, so he died to the law. Paul did. That's what, this is actually what it refers to. Retroactive positional truth. We're in union with Christ when we're saved. Now under the Mosaic Law, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. That's why the best thing the law can do for us is kill us. The wages of sin is death. But Christ died under the law. Christ died under the law. And the wages of sin is death. And Christ died under the law, which recognizes that we're all sinners. So he paid the price. 
Therefore, Christ fulfilled the law, and we are in union with Christ, and since he fulfilled it, we fulfill it in a different way through our unique spiritual life, and this will come out. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified. This is Paul saying, I have been crucified. Again, this is retroactive positional sanctification. I have been crucified with Christ. And this is the corrected translation. I have been crucified with Christ in the past with the result that I keep on being crucified with Christ forever. And it is no longer I who lives. That is in the sphere of the law. Paul is saying, I no longer live in the sphere of the law, but Christ lives in me. Now, we all know that Christ indwells us, but this is a different meaning. It is not referring to the indwelling of Jesus Christ. Christ living in Paul means that the thinking of Christ is being produced in Paul. Christ lives in me, Paul says. This is the new law, a higher law. We don't follow the Mosaic Law, but what do we follow? Christ in me, Christ in you. And what is that? You developing the thinking of Christ through learning the Word of God daily so that you can come to have the thinking of Christ. Being crucified in Christ doesn't mean you have to do anything. doesn't mean you have to uh, give up something as the Catholics do. On Ash Wednesday, they put a, a dot on the middle of their forehead and then a dot of ash. And then they say, I will give up something that I enjoy so that I can reflect Jesus Christ in his crucifixion because he gave up so much for me. I'm going to give up something for him. That's what the Catholics say, and that's not what it means. And they distort this passage. It means we're positionally in Christ by faith alone in Christ. We don't have to do anything. We are recognized under a new sphere, not the sphere of the law, but the fact that we can have the thinking of Christ. Then continuing... So the life I now live physically, I live by means of doctrine with reference to the Son of God who loved me and gave himself. And again, this is aorist tense, A-O-R-I-S-T. Aorist tense means he died once and for all as a substitute for us. So I have been crucified with Christ, retroactive positional sanctification. In the past with the result that I keep on being crucified with Christ forever. And it is no longer I who lives in the sphere of the Mosaic Law is what that means. And it is no longer I who lives but Christ in me. The unique spiritual life of the thinking of Christ. So the life I now live physically, I live by means of doctrine. Not by means of the law. You might have by means of faith. This is what is believed, and what is believed is doctrine. I live by means of doctrine, the Word of God, with reference to the Son of God who loved me and gave himself once and for all as a substitute for me. So you must have the thinking of Christ produced in you. Not the law, but the thinking of Christ. This is a higher law. And it is Paul who's living his unique spiritual life. He's living under this higher law. And even though Christ does truly indwell believers, this is a reference to the fact that we can have the thinking of Christ. It's a reference to our unique spiritual life. So you live the life of Christ when you're filled with the Spirit. You live the life of Christ when you're living your unique spiritual life, utilizing the two power options, three spiritual skills, four spiritual mechanics, ten problem-solving devices. These are the things that enable us to live the unique spiritual life. So turn in your Bibles to Romans 8, 2. And this actually talks about the new law. We're not under the Mosaic law. We don't have to be following uh, the Sabbath. We're not Israelites. We can eat pork. We're not Israelites. We're under a different law, a higher law, a law of grace. And Romans 8, 2 explains, actually Romans 8, 2 through 8, 4 explains a new law. Now in Romans 8, 2 through 8, 4, we have two different laws delineated here. We're gonna, it's going to talk about the law of Moses and it's going to talk about the new law, the new law, the unique spiritual life. For the law of the spirit of life, what's that? Your unique spiritual life being filled with God the Holy Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus 
That's the law of the filling of the Spirit, much higher than the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law cannot produce the filling of the Spirit. If you follow the Mosaic law, you're not filled with the Spirit. You're working in the energy of the flesh. For the law of the Spirit of life hath set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is the Mosaic law. So what set you free? A new life. A unique spiritual life has set you free from sin and death. That means when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're not sinning. If you are sinning, you're in the energy of the flesh. When you're filled with the Spirit, you're not sinning. It's an absolute. You're either filled with the Spirit, not sinning, or in the energy of the flesh and sinning all the time. It's an absolute. There's no in-between. And you can be living under the Mosaic Law and then you're in the energy of the flesh and you are sinning constantly. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus Jesus, hath set me free from the law of sin and death. 8.3 For what the law could not do in that it was weakened through the flesh. You see, you get all these uh, declarations from the law of what you should do. And later on we will notice the rich young ruler and he thought he was living under the law perfectly. And Jesus Christ is going to straighten him out on that and say, no, you weren't. Have you given all your money to the poor? He's going to say, he's going to get really sheepish about that because he's a greedy man. And, God's going to, and our Lord Jesus Christ is going to tell him, no, you haven't followed the law exactly. And that good fellow went to hell. He was a good fellow too, but he never believed in Christ. For what the law could not do in that it was weakened through the flesh, that is our old sin nature, we are sinners, and the law cannot justify, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for a sin offering condemned sin in the flesh. So it was Jesus Christ who bore the sins of the world and as a result, he fulfilled the law, and it's not for us anymore. That is, the Mosaic law is not for us. That doesn't mean we're lawless. It means we're given a higher law. 8.4 That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. And you will say, you just said I wasn't under the law. You're not under the Mosaic law. There are two different laws delineated here. And it starts out talking about the law of the Spirit of life. Then it talks about how the Mosaic law is ineffective. And then it again goes and talks about the righteousness of the law. Now, if you don't know anything about the Bible and you definitely don't know Greek or anything like that, you'd get very confused by this because you would say, okay, I'm not under the law. And then you would read that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. And then you would say, I've got to fulfill the law. Therefore, you see the importance of a pastor teacher to delineate these things to you. No way you could get this by reading it on your own. You would be so confused. It's just unreal how confusing it could be. But that the righteousness of the law, this is a higher law. This is not the Mosaic law. This is the law of the Spirit as mentioned in Romans 8 too. That the righteousness of the law, a higher law, might be fulfilled in us. That is a point in time being fulfilled by the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Who walk? Now, how do I know it's the law of the Spirit of life? Because it will answer it right here. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The higher law is being filled with the Spirit. The higher law is your unique spiritual life. It's what we have. And you will not fulfill your spiritual life by following the Mosaic law. You will not fulfill your unique spiritual life by following denominations who do nothing but go back to covenant theology. They're so far from the spiritual life, it's disgusting and sad. And they're arrogant about being away from the spiritual life. You can almost read Galatians on your own and get a sense that it's faith alone in Christ alone. Almost. Galatians is so tough on legalism, you can almost take the entire book of Galatians, read it for yourself, and understand that you're not saved by the law. It's so clear even in the King James in many places. Yet they don't believe it. And they're still following covenant theology. And they're ignoring Paul just as everyone else was ignoring Paul at this point. And when you ignore Paul, you ignore the spiritual life. So now in Galatians 2.21, Galatians 2.21, 
Now this is where Paul's really going to hit him. This is the last thing said to Peter. And then he's going to switch his focus from Peter to an entire congregation. And not just one congregation, the congregations of many Galatian churches. Galatians 2.21 I do not cancel out the grace of God. It's getting awfully dark out there, isn't it? I mean, to be, I mean, it was uh, daylight till 8.30 last night. It might be about to rain, huh? Galatians 2.21 I do not cancel out the grace of God. I forget, I did have it written down what it said in the King James. I do not Set aside is a good translation, but that's not King James, is it? New King James. That's a pretty good one. Set aside, cancel, whatever you have. Hmm? Nullify is a good one. What is that King James? I don't know. Set aside. Well, anybody who has King James, get a new Bible. <laughs> that's a terrible, terrible translation. Galatians 2.21 I do not cancel out the grace of God. And that means he does not return to the legalism of the Mosaic law. I do not cancel out the grace of God. For if righteousness could come through the law, then Christ died for nothing. That's tough. And in fact, I can't tell you how many times I've told my legalistic relatives the same thing. I could even show them the verse. And they would not believe it. I've shown them the verses. Would not believe it. I do not cancel out the grace of God. For if righteousness could come through the law. Oh, you follow the law. Yes, you do. Oh, you fast. You're so wonderful. Oh, you yield and tithe and do all that stuff. If righteousness could come through the law, then Jesus Christ died for nothing. You are bringing to naught Jesus Christ. That's the evil of it. And I tell you, by the time we get done with Galatians, you will see how evil legalists are. They are totally evil. And they are so and evil is so influential, they even got Peter and Barnabas to go along with them. That's why you've got to separate from them and stay away. It's, you have to. You can't change them, but they can change you. If they could change Barnabas, and if they could change the apostle Peter... And they in and, and Acts, we will note, they'll even change the Apostle Paul, the man who wrote Galatians. And they'll get him to follow legalism. And they'll do it after he wrote Galatians. And after he wrote First and Second First Corinthians, at least. First and Second Corinthians. And they're going to get to him after all of that. And he's going to learn even more and more doctrine from what he knows now. This is the first epistle he wrote. And he's going to know more and more and more. And then he's about going to reach a spiritual peak and go right into legalism and take vows. Why? Because he's going to associate with legalists. We are commanded to separate because I'll tell you what, if the Apostle Paul can be led astray, don't you even blink an eye for a second and think you can't. We all can. That's why we are commanded separation. And if we decide not to, and if you say, well, uh, nobody's going to tell me who I can hang out with, well, I'm not telling you who you can hang out with. God is. And if you're going to snub your nose and say, I'll do what I want. They're my friends. Have fun with them. They're going to take away your crown. And you better have all the fun you can with them on this earth because they'll take away your crown. And you'll have nothing to show in heaven. Why? You'll follow him. And Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul himself almost lost everything. He almost died to sin face to face with death. He recovered, but he almost did. He was nearly beaten to death. More than on one occasion, but in this case, nearly beaten to death. So Peter, he's really chewing out Peter now, and he says, First of all, Peter, you've made Christ out to be a minister of sin. Secondly, Peter, you you are also saying that Christ died for nothing. You're saying that Christ died in vain and you have to follow the law to be justified and Jesus Christ did not justify you. 
Legalism in all forms cancels God's grace. Legalism in all forms cancels God's grace. We get that from a verse in Romans which we've noted. The more you work for salvation, the deeper in debt you go. And that is faith plus something. You see, if you add anything to faith, it cancels it out, and that's why it says that in Galatians 2.21. I do not cancel out the grace of God. For if righteousness could come through the law, then Christ died for nothing. What this is saying, if you add anything to faith, it cancels out the work of Christ. That's why there are a lot of people who think they're saved and are not. They've been adding things to faith. They said, well, I believed and I repented. As soon as they added something, if at the moment they received what would be called the gospel, if they received it and at the same time they said, I believe but I must be baptized, or I believe and I have to feel sorry for my sins, the feeling sorry for the sins part cancels out the faith part. I believe and must be baptized. The baptism part cancels out the faith part. Now there's a lot of people like the Galatians who believe and they're saved and then go in for it. And I've told you about the four generations and how it usually goes. First generation believes in Christ. And they tell their children believe in Christ. Second generation believes in Christ but they start going for legalism and they add something. That's the second generation. They believe in Christ, they're saved and they add something. Then the third generation comes along and their parents tell them, believe in Christ and add something. And those children believe in Christ and add something and are lost. And then that goes on down to the fourth generation, lost, adding stuff to salvation. So you can believe in Christ and be saved and then add something later and be saved. And that is probably for the middle-aged people in this uh, country and around this area, that's probably their status. They believed in Christ, they're saved, but now they're adding something. Now their children, it's a different story. My generation and people younger than me, it's a whole different story. Why? Their parents at one time just believed. And then they started adding something and they had children and they told their children, invite Christ into your heart. Now they didn't believe that themselves at first, but later on they believed it. Or they said, you uh, believe in Christ and be baptized. So their children think that way and their children as a result are not saved. And I know it because I've dealt with people in my generation who grew up in these religions and their parents think they're saved because they've been going to church with them, but they don't even have a clue as to what salvation is. They're confused. And you want to hang around churches like that where children get confused and don't even know they're saved? Tragic. Tragedy. We're dealing with people's souls whether you know it or not. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted related to grace. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.